The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. You are now tuned in to the PA Power Podcast, College Edition, featuring Mason Beckman and Tristan Warner. PA Power Wrestling. PA Power Wrestling. Pennsylvania is wrestling. Welcome in wrestling fans. You are now dialed into the PA Power College Podcast. As Jason Bryant of the Matt Talk Podcast Network said, I'm Tristan Warner. Joined, as always, by my main man, Mason Beckman, a.k.a. Beck Diggity. Mason, episode 18, ready to rock and roll. Absolutely, man. Podcast is now an adult. It has graduated high school. It Maybe uh, maybe it's got its NLI signed. I don't know. It could be, could be a late sign onto a college. But, uh, yeah, man, we're, uh, we're rolling right along. This, uh, this, I, th- I think we're getting better. You know, we're getting some traction at least. So, OWs of this past weekend, uh, not a crazy busy weekend, but there were some really big results. Hydley getting that Berger win in the duel was obviously huge for Hayden. Um, and a match that he really controlled. And Berger, by the way, with a rough weekend, went 0-2. But then Lavalley, he takes Lavalley down on overtime to win that match and to win a tournament. Um, like you said, huge wins, not just because he's a freshman, period. Those are two All-Americans, one of whom is a national finalist. Uh, the other guy that I had on here for OW of the Week, and not a PA guy, but uh, Bryce Meredith beat the number two and number five guys in America back-to-back to win Reno. He beats Jaden Ironman out of Missouri in the semis, and the Ironman match is a really good example of why Meredith... Of, of what makes Meredith so good. You know, Ironman goes out, totally burns him on a duck, go into the third period, it's tied 2-2, and Meredith just has so many ways to beat you that Ironman takes bottom, and Meredith was just willing to, you know, in 10, 15, 20 second clips, do the work and, ro- you know, road Ironman for the whole two periods to win, which that's, that is so much harder to do than I think people realize. Um, when you take a guy that's an all American like Ironman, that's just really, really good, especially when they're in a situation where they fully understand that they need to clear themselves out, you know, early enough, if they clear early enough, they win, but if nothing else, they need to clear out to get, you know, to not get beat. Riding a guy for a full two minutes under those circumstances is really hard to do and it takes a lot of mental toughness and that's a very good example of what makes Meredith so good. And then in the finals, uh, I mean, Meredith and Kevin Jack, this one was 4-3 Meredith's way. Those two are just so much fun to watch wrestle. They're, that, it's the best rivalry in college wrestling, you know, especially when you talk about their history as far as being teammates at NC State. Jack went in the spot, so Meredith transfers back to Wyoming and, and all the different things. It's such a fun rivalry. They're both so much fun to watch wrestle, especially against one another, so... Um, yeah, Meredith was, was the other OW of the weekend. I thought that really deserved mentioning. Um, yeah, that being said too, that we should also point out how good that that shows that this true freshman from Cornell, Yanni, I don't even want to try to pronounce his last name. Is, already has a win over Bryce Meredith. Yeah. Already with a win over Meredith too. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you know, Yanni, he's won a cup. That's, that's kind of scary for, for that kid's future. Yeah. You know, he's, uh. He's won himself a couple of world titles and everything. and I don't think anybody, you know, coming into the year, we all knew Yanni was going to have a lot of success. It's just the question was, is he at that very top tier, which at this weight consistently has been comprised of Heil as that 1A tier, then that 1B tier is Jack and Meredith. And I think Ironman has kind of proven to put himself there now. Um, and obviously Yanni has certainly proven with his win over Meredith to be on that one B tier. And, you know, I mean, until anybody beats Hyo, you can't say they're there. But Diak Mahalas is certainly, like you said, in very impressive fashion as a true freshman, proven that he's up there. So uh, that that's going to be a really fascinating way to watch how it plays out as the season progresses. Um, so... Going from OWs to our challenge bricks, some things that came up. Uh, first of all, so we're recording this on Monday like we normally do. 
there are a couple of Monday dual meets going on right now or that occurred today. Who wrestles a dual meet on a Monday? I mean, like, <laughs> I'm all for, you know, lacing up and scrapping any time. It's just weird. I don't know in, in my entire wrestling career that I ever wrestled a dual meet on a Monday. I don't know that I ever competed on a Monday. Uh, actually, yes, I did. The one Monday I can say for sure I competed was Memorial Day at the NHSCA duels. But outs, <laughs> outside... Day three, Wayne Danger, yeah, baby. Yeah, that's the only... Uh, We're on the same team, yeah, too. Back with those bright orange shirts that said, Shut your mouth, let's wrestle. Uh, the Scooby-Doo singlet. Yeah. Never forget. Yeah, that was those were, those were the glory days, man. But... Um, I will say I have wrestled. We wrestled one college dual meet on a Monday, and it was uh, Kent State. No idea why. It was the last match we had to wrestle before Christmas break. I got the pleasure of wrestling Ian Miller. So uh, I cannot say my Monday dual meet experience is a positive one. Case of the month. So I'm going to have to agree with you on case this one. Case of the Mondays. Um, That's right. Just like Tyler Berger on the yeah, front page of Flow Wrestling for, right now. Not good for Tyler Berger. Case of the Mondays. Um, yeah, Monday dual no. meets are just weird. And... I'm not necessarily hating on it. It's it was just really a curious thing to me, and maybe it is because you mentioned that yours was right around the same time of year before finals. Maybe it just has to do with when guys wrap up the academic semester. And it would have literally been like today. It was like the December 18th or 19th or 16th or something like that. The Monday right yeah, before that must Christmas. Be it then. Yep. So anyway, I thought that was weird. The other challenge brick that. And this one was really interesting. So Pitt, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but Pitt had an 0-2 weekend. They lost to Clarion Saturday and Bucknell Sunday. And That's kind of unprecedented, at least in, in the modern era. I, I think that's unprecedented, period. Well, for sure the, lo- the, for sure the yeah. loss to Bucknell. Clarion, you know, if you go, if you go a couple day, de- yeah. decades back, Clarion was a national power, but... You're absolutely right. That's unprecedented in the modern day, you know, for our generation and period for Bucknell. So Keith Gavin basically threw his own challenge brick at his team. And I don't have the direct quote in front of me, but said something to the effect of when you value the process and and, and when you put your faith in the process and, you know, chasing something that's in front of you, it's a lot harder to let the fear of losing, you know, kind of cripple you when you go out and compete. He's like, when all you value is winning and not getting better and not the process, it becomes much easier to worry about losing and allow that to paralyze you. And he's like, we got some guys that have embraced the process and embraced that mindset. We have a lot of guys that haven't. And he's like, all, you know, all good things take time, but we're just not there yet. So I thought that while... You know, it was stated in, I want to say, a subtle manner or a more so of a subtle manner. Those are pretty big words, man. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I can't say that I disagree with him there. I mean, that's an interesting approach to to get the message across. But, I mean, he's clearly not satisfied with not only his team's results, but it sounds like his team's effort out there. So, I like it. Yeah, I like it. And, you know, I don't think... So, I know that in all the dual meets I was part of in college, never once did we get laid into because of result. You know, because of a win or a loss result. We had dual meets where we'd get beat and we'd go into the locker room and it was like, man, that sucks. But, you know, because we the the effort and the fight and everything was there, sometimes you just get beat, right? It's not... Not ideal, and you're still not thrilled about it, but it's not a situation where a coach is going to walk into a locker room and unload on his guys, right? Yep, I you, agree. You know, Same here. And, and then on the flip side, there were dual meets. I specifically remember one that was that was ugly. Uh, we wrestled at Navy, which we always we always wrestled like crap in Annapolis, and I don't know why, but. We wrestled at Navy my redshirt junior year, and we won the duel pretty soundly, but we just did not wrestle well. And we got laid into, I mean, bad in the locker room, as bad as I was ever part of. Um, You know, so I, I think, especially college coaches, but, you know, high-level coaches in general, 
they don't value – obviously, again, everybody's trying to win. That goes without being said. But they value their guys embracing the process and and cutting loose and, and you know controlling the effort and controlling the fight more than anything. So I'm with you, Tristan. I, I love Gavin's comments, and I think they're – I would assume this was something that in his head he thought – you know, he kind of came up with before he made the comments in the interview. You know, to to try to maybe spark his team. Yeah, you'd have to think so. I mean, I looked at the, I saw the headline that Pitt went 0-2 on the weekend and was a little surprised to see they lost to Clarion and Bucknell. And then I read through the box score and it almost seems like there were a couple of results on there that were surprising to me that, you know, guys clearly didn't wrestle very well, got picked off by somebody random. I want to say, um, so Gavin probably definitely dissatisfied with their performance. And obviously it probably goes further into that, into how he thinks they competed. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, to be honest, you know, if we're going to be frank, I think that the pit has some guys that especially on the, on the heavier half of their lineup, some guys that went the hype that was the hype that was around them when they were recruited and then when they were brought in and and past career accolades that these guys have, they haven't lived up to what the hype was, what the hype around them was saying that they would. Yeah, exactly. When we were going through our team previews this summer, I mean, Pitt was one of the most teams that we were excited about looking at. We went through the roster and just talked about how many good kids they've brought in and even transfers and with this new coaching staff, like it was a resurgence almost at Pitt. And obviously anytime you get a new coaching staff, it's kind of like what we're seeing with Iowa state right now. It's going to take a couple of years for uh, you know, a new coaching staff to turn it around, but it's definitely probably not the start that, uh, you know, Gavin wanted, obviously. No, not at all. So, I mean, like you said, I'm sure they'll be just fine in time. Um, you know, I know they've got a couple guys that are banged up right now, you know, Nick Sinetta, had a rough go of it this weekend. Part of it, obviously, is the fact that Brock Zacherl and Tyler Smith are very, very good. And, and part of it is he's, you know, still dealing with the injury that he had to default out of Vegas with. So, let me also say, since Zanetta came on the show, too, props to him for going out there and wrestling, even though he's banged up. We talked about last weekend how so many of these top guys, for whatever reason, whether it's their decision or a coach decision, will sit out and not wrestle, especially if they're a little bit dinged up and they got to go wrestle a tough guy. I want to say props to Zanetta for going up head to head against two top, you know, 10, 12 guys in the country, went back to back at them both, not 100%. So good for him. I agree. And I mean, I, that's kind of always been Nikki's MO. He's always been a super tough kid that, you know, could be more beat up than anybody on the roster and would never let you know. So I agree. Props to him for wrestling. Um, so yeah, we, you know, we talked about Pitt's weekend. Oh, and two, not ideal for them. I, I, an unprecedented thing. I don't really think we need to dive into that, but I will say this for the Clarion program, that that's a huge win for them. You know, for all that they're doing out there, I, I, I Clarion's headed in the right direction and they're doing it quietly. They're doing it with, with recruiting classes that aren't necessarily built around quote unquote blue chips, you know, other than probably, I would say Brock Zacherl was, uh, you know, he was a pretty elite kid in high school, you know, on a national stage. And I, I got to believe he was a top 10 kid in the country in his weight class, his senior year. But I don't, you know, that that's not a roster full of guys that won absolutely everything under the sun, you know, Fargo titles and blah, blah, blah in high school. But they're quietly, they're doing a great job, man. They're getting better. And, and then Bucknell, I can't imagine that the Bucknell program has very many wins over the Pitt program. So, you know, big wins for Clarion and Bucknell. You know, on the other side of the coin, we kind of already discussed the Pitt perspective. Um, but not to dwell on that, we already touched a little bit on Reno, so we might as well finish, you know, kind of expand on that a little bit more. Hayden Hydley, we talked about just what a weekend. Um, you know, he's still undefeated. I think he's eleven and zero. And one of the interesting things now about Hayden, he's got wins over the number two and number seven this weekend, and and Lavalle and Berger. And he, between now and NCAA's, the only match he won't be favored in will be when they wrestle Ohio State, and he wrestles Jordan. 
which, I mean, obviously is a match that he's got to be right there in. you got to believe, right? So Hayden has put himself in a position, and there's still a lot of season to wrestle, but they don't go to Scuffler Midlands. He's put himself in a position that he could very realistically show up to Cleveland in March undefeated. That's hard to believe, but that's awesome. I mean, usually even these stud guys who come in as a redshirt freshman, they run into some hammers somewhere along the way and get, even if it's early in the season, get taken down. But like you said, it, I mean, that's very conceivable at this point, especially considering they're not going to Southern Scuffle or Midlands. I know NC State's usually at one or the other, or sometimes they'll have their starters at one and their redshirts at the other. I'm a little surprised. looks like they took the Reno route this year, but yeah, I mean, the more power to him if he's able to pull that off. Well, you know they're going to Italy, right? That's right. I did forget about that. Yeah, we so, did talk about that on one of the previous episodes. Yeah, they're going to freaking Italy in like January, like late December, early January to wrestle Oklahoma State. So, so I can safely say I'm incredibly jealous that they're going to wrestle in Oklahoma State. I think in Naples. Uh, that is, I don't know how that came to be. I don't know whose idea that was. I definitely don't know how they raised the money to do it. But that is such a cool thing. That That is a really cool opportunity for so many different reasons. Um, yeah, no disrespect to Chattanooga, Tennessee, or Evanston, Illinois, but I think Naples, Italy sounds uh, takes the cake oh on that God, one. Oh, God, Evanston. Um, <laughs> gr- the windiest place I've ever been. Great place, but we ought to next week, when we preview Midlands, we ought to dive into some Midlands stories because it's, it's an awesome event, but man, is that a miserable trip? Oh, absolutely miserable. So, I could, I could tell. Yep, we yeah, got to tell some stories. We'll, on we'll that dive one. into some Midland stories. There's actually in the interview with, uh, so Princeton head coach Chris Ayers is our guest on this podcast. There's actually a hilarious Midland story in that interview. So, um, I guess we kind of already got started on that, but and you'll hear that whole interview later in this episode. Um, to stay on track with Reno. We mentioned Oklahoma State, so he's not a PA guy, but Dayton Fix wins Reno in his first college tournament. Um, he takes out Sean Fawes, who was around a 12 guy from North Carolina State. He takes Fawes out in the finals, 2-1 on a kind of a, on a last 10 seconds takedown. So Fix proving that he's right there with you know top 12 guys. You know Fawes definitely isn't on that elite tier yet with guys like Tomasello and Cruz and Suriano and and Lezak. But, you know, he, he's definitely, pro, you know, Fix is showing that even in folk style, he's a top 10, 12 guy. So that's a big win. Let me ask you this, Mason. Uh, were you a little surprised by the closeness of Dayton Fix's wins? I saw a couple of his wins, at least in semis and finals, were both 2-1. to one. And I'm not disrespecting what he did, obviously, to come in as a freshman and win Reno and beat a top 12 guy is incredible. But compared to some of these guys, like, I mean... Dayton Fix owns a win over Spencer Lee, who, in my mind, is one of the best high school wrestlers I've ever seen. And Dayton Fix, I cannot remember the last time he lost in any style. Um, I almost pictured him coming in here and just dominating everybody. Were you a little surprised, or is he better at freestyle? What what perspective do you have well, on this? Well, number one, I do think he's better at freestyle. I think that he his style and his mindset are much more geared towards freestyle. When you make the transition to Division One wrestling, as you and I both know, one of the big things, man, is mat wrestling and the the scrambling. Guys are just exponentially better at both. So for Dayton in freestyle, he's really explosive. And when you hit a guy in freestyle, you know when you pull the trigger and get to a leg, there's a lot of scrambling to be done. But it's a totally different type of scrambling. And, and Dayton has spent so much more time. And has been exposed to that so much more, you know, at the world level. He hasn't really been exposed to that type of scrambling, that level of scrambling at the collegiate level, right? Uh, And the same can be said for Matt wrestling. Maybe it's because he spent so much time training for under, you know, the under 23 world championships. Maybe it's just the adjustment to college wrestling. Maybe it's both. But Matt wrestling, I don't want to say is a concern, but it's still a relative weakness for Fix. So I'm not shocked that his results were that close. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things that go into it. But more than anything, and you and I have talked about this before, people don't, the general fan doesn't understand how good every single guy in Division One wrestling is. Dayton Fix is an incredible talent. Do not, you know, do not misconstrue what I'm saying. He's, I think he's an incredible talent. 
I'm sure he will go on to do really special things for Oklahoma State. But that transition for everybody is extremely difficult to make. You know, and, and it says a lot about Dayton that he's finding ways to win those matches against a guy like Foz, who's really hard to wrestle. Um, yeah. Especially those two, from what I remember, have very contrasting builds. Uh, Fix is pretty short and stocky. And I, if I remember watching Sean Faust, he's pretty long and lanky and f- kind of funky. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, t- you know, not I'm not shocked by the closeness of the results, but I don't think it's, uh, you know, there's no cause for worry, obviously. Yeah, moving on. Also at Reno, um, Sertzis drops down to 149 and and wins the tournament. So obviously, I guess that poses a, a another the question about him and Josh Maruka being at the same weight for Arizona State. Who do they start? Maruka obviously a Pennsylvania kid, so that has direct implications to some PA power right there. What do you think about that? I mean, it looks like Maruka not only beat him in the wrestle off, but also placed higher than him at one of the first tournaments they went to. So I would still have to say the spot's his, wouldn't you? Well, I thought it was, I thought it was Shields that beat him in a wrestle off because he wasn't. Oh, yeah, you're right. So, yeah, you're right. He was at 57, and then he dropped down. So, yeah, interesting uh, predicament the Sun Devils have there at 149. Yeah, you know, it's going to be interesting, man. Um, I, It'll be curious to see. i got to believe they'll both enter Midlands, and that's going to go a long way to determine what the situation is going forward. I I mean, personally... It's hard to sit a returning, uh, even though it wasn't last year, a former NCAA champion. And he's at his right weight class. It's pretty hard to sit him on the I bench. I agree, but I just don't. I don't think Sertis is still that same guy. Um, you know, first of all, I think Josh Maruka is very, very good. Josh Maruka is a top ten or twelve kid, and Sertis, you know, he's never gonna, he's never going to be a guy that lights up the scoreboard, puts a ton of points on the board, which you don't have to be. But you know, in watching him in Reno, when he was you know, when when he won his national title and when he took third the following year, he was so sharp. His attacks were so clean. I just don't see that out of Sertis right now, and maybe that will come with time with the, with the adjustment to the weight. I don't know. But I think right now Maruk is the better guy. That would be my prediction going forward. But, you know, I'm sure it's a day-to-day situation that the Arizona State coaching staff is watching them both very closely. So we'll see. And a little added emotional uh, inspiration or motivation, if you will. Sertz is making his return to Northwestern to wrestle at Midland. So I know he did wrestle there last year, didn't have a very good performance, but he was up a weight. And it did look like he was kind of, I don't want to say out of shape, but it almost looked like he hadn't really been training for the tournament. So uh, it will be interesting for me to see how he does down at his natural weight back at Northwestern. You know, you'd have to think there's some kind of an emotional motivation there for him to excel at his, you know, on the campus of his former school. Yeah, you know, I hadn't even thought about that, but I'm I'm sure you're I'm sure you're right. You know, he's had a lot of success in that gym, so so we'll see. Uh, wrapping up Reno, we already talked about Bryce Meredith, Kevin Jack, and then Pete Renda just pretty much lit everybody up. Uh Tector pinned his way through the field, you know, was really impressive. So and Renda, another guy that's been on the podcast, so shout out to him. And Good news is our next guest, which will be next podcast, but the man, the myth, the legend, that is Hayden Heidley, we'll get him on here. So you guys will get to hear from him next podcast, so that'll be fun. Um, He's already agreed to that, so we just got to set the logistics of it up. Um, You know, Renda and Heidley, just to wrap up those two, they both picked up wins over Nebraska too. NC State beat Nebraska in Lincoln 29-3. to that's that's ridiculous. Um, but I don't think there's much to dive into other than that with that result. Uh, Penn State rolled over Indiana 44-3. I don't really need to dive into that. I think that... From 49 to 84, all their national champs, I think, pinned or won by injury yeah, default. Yeah, so needless to say, Penn State's all right. So I think they scored 6, 12, 18, 24. I think they scored 30 points in a row. Ridiculous. That is, a, that is absolutely yep. absurd. Not much more needs to be said uh, there. Lock Haven goes 3-0 on the weekend, you know, with uh, the main one being a 37-2 win over Bloomsburg. So Bloom must have lost a team point in there somewhere. Uh, 
Yeah, I think it said the 184 bout, if I read it right, but that could have been a different duel. And then um, Andy Schutt. Schutt's got his third win over Failman of the Year, yeah, I want to say. I think I think you're right. So, sounds like Schutz has returning national qualifier, and I think EWL champ, or at least runner-up, DJ Failman's uh, number here early in the season. Both of those are PA kids too, right? I know Failman's uh, McDowell, I want to say. And, uh... And shuts his, what, you said Wyoming? Yeah, Wyoming Valley West, because uh, Steve Minich was one of his high school coaches. There you so, go. So, uh, what else we got here? Cleveland State Open. Nino Bonacorsi, pretty much, I would say, is... The- Worst tournament ever, by the way. Worst tournament ever. In what manner of speaking? Most miserable trip. Worst run tournament. Stuffy, little, disgusting gym. We'd wrestle, like, I remember one year... Uh, I want to say like my sophomore year, made it all the way to the finals, ended up losing in the finals. But I mean, I think we wrestled the final match at like 9.30 p.m. or something like that. Started the tournament at 8 or 9 in the morning. Just an absolutely brutal day. Brutal trip. Well, that's fair. I tell you what, the Edinburgh Open was up there for us. That's... Yeah, I, I would lump those two together. I never went to that one, but from what I heard, it sounds like those two were... Hand in hand, and also right across the border from each other. So yeah, and wrestling in that freaking bubble up at Edinburgh. Cleveland State takes the yeah. cake for me and my brother. I can speak for him. Yeah, too. I was not, I was not a huge fan of the Edinburgh <laughs> Open, especially because the one time I wrestled in it, I got beat in the finals. So yeah, um, but yeah, the Cleveland State Open. So Nino Bonacorsi wins one eighty four, and the real interesting result here is he had an eight three win in the finals over Dakota Gear of Edinburgh. Two months ago, not even two months ago, a month and a half ago. That's impressive. Yeah, a month and a half ago, that's a match that Gear won. So, all the things that I've heard about Bonacorsi and just from knowing Nino, he's a kid that will just, he's just not going to stop coming. He just has a motor that never quits, both, you know, when he's competing and in the room. So, I think that's proof right there that Nino is already making very substantial progress. Yeah, it's a shame Nino is not in pit starting lineup. Sounds like Keith Gavin could use that kind of uh not only that talent, but that uh that drive and that determination. But I guess they're saving him for next year, so the future of Pitt still has still has some hope for sure. For sure. Uh and Mickey Phillippe as well, who transferred there and you also have took second. Yeah, he took second. He lost to uh Little Arusia in the finals, Cornell kid. So um Vitaly Arugia, I think. Younger brother, Nick Arugia, who was a starter at Cornell for some time. So, uh, a couple of good results for Pitt. Jake Woodley, who's a North Allegheny native, he's out at Oklahoma, was the runner-up at 197. Do you know who beat him? Oh, if you hadn't asked me, I, I could have told you. I can look it up. But So, Woodley finishes a runner-up, and then Evan DeLong, who was a Kane native, was a state champ at Kane, now a Clarion, he wins 174. Is DeLong redshirting by chance? Yeah, I saw that he was unattached. That's what I thought. He, he could really help uh, Clarion's lineup, too. I'm surprised that he is uh, not in their lineup. Uh, I mean, because they're having a pretty good year already, and if they have him, he's I mean, he's national qualifier-type material for sure. Oh, I would absolutely have to think so. Um, so I don't know what the reasoning behind it is, but I'm sure they have a plan, needless to say. And then another just... Off the wall result over the weekend. North Carolina beats Nebraska in Lincoln. Like th- yep. that's just without Dalton Macri. Yeah, without Macri, that's just not a result that I'll be honest. That's not a result I ever thought I'd say. Tough weekend for Nebraska. Yeah, tough weekend for Nebraska. Um, I mean, we talked about and Tyler Berger. Yeah, Kennedy Monday pinned Tyler Berger in the first period. Yeah, did you see it? No, but I saw the picture on the front of Flow. It looked like it was a cradle. Yeah, it was a wild scramble. Monday got in on a shot, and they started rolling around. And Monday actually almost pinned him a couple times before he ended up. But they got to kind of rolling around, and Monday um, ended up in a low-leg cradle. And, I mean, once you're in a low-leg cradle, you're going to be hard-pressed to survive. Kennedy Monday, I watched him wrestle at the uh, National Collegiate Open last year, and he is extremely long for a 149-pounder. I mean, he's taller than I think most, like, 184-pounders. He is very long. 
At least he looked like it up close when I watched him. So it doesn't surprise me that he could get in some funky situations and slap a cradle on. Yeah, his frame is ridiculous. I mean, he's built just like his dad. He looks like a spider, yeah. Well, he's built just like his dad. He's just not as thick yet. He's got the big, broad shoulders, his long arms. So, I mean, if he fills out, I got to believe he'll end up as like a... 65-pounder probably by the time he's oh, done. Oh, more than that. I mean, he's a 57 already. Yeah. He could easily be a 74. I realize that's a lot of weight, but with his frame, if he thickens up, it, you know that, that weight will get packed on in a hurry. Um... So that that's that's pretty much what we got for results. Um, we don't really have much of a weekend preview because there's really not much going on. Not nah, not much of a weekend preview in terms of wrestling. Just weekend preview is it's Christmas time, which is awesome. It's my favorite time of the year, especially now that I don't have to cut weight during Christmas. So oh wait, time out. What? It's your favorite time of the year. I'm pretty sure we had this debate a couple weeks ago, and you were debating that Thanksgiving is better than Christmas. No, I didn't say that it was better than Christmas. What I said was... <laughs> Colin Mason's bluff right here on the PA Power What Power I Power said Podcast. was, I don't understand why everybody skips over Thanksgiving to go to Christmas. I love Christmas. It is one of, if not my like the best time of year in my book. Uh, okay. But okay. my whole deal is, I love Thanksgiving. It's a super American holiday. Gives you all kind of, kinds of awesome, fun stuff. Again, day drinking is socially acceptable, which is awesome. You day drink and watch football all day. And everybody just skips over it. And I think that's crap. I, I love Thanksgiving and I love Christmas. So November is Thanksgiving's month. December is Christmas's month. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Don't misconstrue what I said. No comment. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's pretty much the weekend preview there. All you poor fools that have to wake up early and go run or go wrestle and all that stuff. Um, I know it sucks at the time and I know this is a cliche, but it is worth it. So haul yourselves out of bed, go get the workout in so you can eat and be merry. Don't be that miserable person at your family's Christmas. Nobody likes that person. Not to mention... The Miserable Wrestler Family Christmas gives all of us a bad name because then everybody expects all of us to be miserable. So don't ruin it for the rest of us. Don't be don't be the reason why we can't have nice things. All right, so I got to ask. You were in Bethlehem this weekend, and you're trying to accuse me of things that are just completely ridiculous. Yep, just to get off the wrestling topic real quick here... Um... Had to mention this, and I and I had to call Mason out on live on the air here. Um, so I asked this guy, who keep in mind, this guy lived in the town of Bethlehem for five years when he attended this college of Lehigh, city so, of Bethlehem, city, city of Bethlehem. All right, so I go up there, checking out some of this Christmas stuff around there. They got this cool Christmas market type thing that I looked up online. It looked pretty cool. Whatever, I go up there and check that out. I asked Mason for a suggestion suggestions on. If there's anything else up there that's cool, like good restaurants or anything, figured, you know, he would know. Um, Mason <laughs> gives me the name of a restaurant, and it doesn't even exist. I, I looked it up on the on the maps, on my GPS. The clo- Which one doesn't exist? You told me to go to a restaurant called the Tap House, and the closest Tap House to Bethlehem was 47 miles away. I don't think it was even in Pennsylvania. What? All right, hang on. The, the restaurant was called the Tap Room. That's close so. enough. <laughs> so, congrats to Mason for, you know, just not really knowing the city of Bethlehem as well as he claims this, it being such this, a such a Lehigh homer. Just, you know, couldn't even give me the name of, quote, the best restaurant in the town. All right, so. first of all, I never said it was the best restaurant in the town. Let me also add that I tried to call you, and you wouldn't pick up the phone because you can't come up with a creative excuse to step away for a second. So you lack creativity and situation awareness. So the question here I had to pose was, on the outline here I have, does Mason really bleed brown and white or is it a front? So that might be our listener question of the week. You guys can chime in and let us know. Here's the place I was thinking of. It's called Taps Tavern. It's over by Revolutions in Bethlehem. So So you were really not even close. It's called Taps as opposed to Tap Room, you jag off. By the way, where did you guys end up going? Uh, I don't even remember. Couldn't even tell you. It was good, oh. though. Good. Good memory. Um, So, yeah, I blame you because you wouldn't pick up the phone. I could have talked you through all these options. 
Next time, man. Next and time. And then what? What? What's just, just know you, know your city better. <sighs> anyway, what's this other thing about high school wrestling is dying? What? What is this nonsense? Yeah, that's the last thing we'll touch on here. Um, I know we're the college podcast, but it was a little bit of a depressing uh, Saturday this past weekend. So I, I'm an assistant coach at Cumberland Valley. We took our guys down to the North Hills Duels, and we wrestled. You know, we go down there thinking we're going to have some tough competition, which we ultimately did at the end of the day. But we had five dual meets against Kiski area, who's, I guess, ranked 19th in the country, I believe. So they were a tough team. They, they smacked us pretty good. Um, but the other four teams we wrestled, North Hills, Penn Hills, Gateway, and Pittsburgh Central Catholic. And, uh, and on paper, and just from knowing what those teams historically are, you know, I was expecting every match to be a, an absolute brawl. But we get down there, um, Penn Hills and Gateway, neither one of those teams, and Pittsburgh Central Catholic, neither one of those teams had more than eight guys on their team. There was at least six forfeits. Um, the Gateway duel took exactly 25 minutes, timed it on my phone. Um, and then this Pittsburgh Central Catholic one may have been even shorter than that. So I'm just going to say, I mean, like I said, North Hills had about a full team, not a great team, but a full team. And Kiski obviously had a full team and, and they were pretty darn good, but it was just disappointing and just more depressing than anything to see. You go down to Pittsburgh, which is the maybe the nation's hotbed of wrestling, if not one of the best. And you wrestle these teams that are historically pretty prominent powerhouse, not powerhouse, but good teams that you're used to hearing good guys come from. And some of them literally have seven or eight kids in their starting lineup. It was just, it was an eye opener for the stat that maybe the state of high school wrestling right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, North Hills and gateway, neither one of them have ever been traditional powers whatsoever. Like Sammy Hillig is, who's by far their best kid. Uh, Sammy, who won the school's first state title last year. Uh, he's still out because his ear got all sorts of messed up. I, quite frankly, think the doctors screwed it up in the process of draining it, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so Sammy's out, which doesn't help. Gateway's just never been great, to be honest with you. And Pitt Central Catholic, ever since um, ever since Sonny left, Sonny Abe, so like when you and I were in high school, like right around the time that I graduated, back when they had, well, I guess you were, it was, Right about between you and I, like when Luster and all those guys were still there, Lorenzo Thomas, um, uh, well, it was a kid to play quarterback for Maryland, Perry Hills, you know, they had a bunch of really good dudes on that team, but since Sonny left, that, uh, you know, because obviously it's a private Catholic school, they kind of have to, I mean, frankly, they kind of have to recruit a little bit. They have to get kids in their pipeline because it's not going to be a situation where, you know, kids just live in the school district. There isn't a school district for Pitt Central Catholic. It's actually very similar. So remember how good Shady Side Academy used to be? Yeah, they were really good. Yeah, Shady Side, the same kind of thing happened. Like they, there was this funky gap where it was just neglected that they needed to get kids into the feeder program. And in a span of like three years, three or four years, Shady Side went from the team that's who we beat. We being Reynolds, like my high school team, we beat in the state finals my sophomore year. Like four years later, they literally didn't have a program because they didn't have kids in the feeder. So those cat, those academies, private schools, blah blah blah. Um, I can kind of understand how that happens when things get neglected. And then Gateway and North Hills again, and you know, Gateway just has never been great, and North Hills has never really been great either. So. Um, I agree that it's not a great sign for high school wrestling, but I would be a lot more worried if you had wrestled Cannon Mac and they didn't have a full team. Right. I mean, you definitely know your Pittsburgh teams better than me. So, I mean, it could be that these teams have always had teams uh, lineups like this. It just was eye opening for me a little bit. I haven't been around high school wrestling for a while. So, I mean, and I've never seen these Pittsburgh teams in doing it. I really just have heard guys, Pittsburgh Central Catholic and. From North Hills, I mean, Penn Hills, you got T. Sean Campbell, right, came from Penn Hills. They only had, I think, seven starters on their team. It was just a little surprising, but, I mean, yeah, a lot of those schools, I guess, do just have good individuals come through now and then. So, no disrespect to those teams. It was just yeah. kind of – wasn't exactly what we were expecting, and we were all just a little bit shocked, I guess. I mean, in Cumberland Valley, we don't have as many guys on our roster as, as we normally do. 
which could be also indicative of the sta- state high school wrestling. But I mean, we still got a full lineup and everything. So just a little surprising Pittsburgh's popular area for wrestling. And it was just more than anything to see so many forfeits. Yeah, that sucks. Um, just not really any other way to put it. So, but not to derail too much. So we'll, like I said before, we got an awesome interview with the head coach of Princeton, Chris Ayers, a guy that has led that program from literally the worst team, the worst program in America, the lowest rated RPI team in the country the year, I think either the year before he got there or his first year there, to now a constant, a consistent top 25 team. They've had All-Americans the last couple of years. So it's a great conversation with him. You know, gives you an inside look at the number one ranked school in America and how they've built their program into what they have. So, um, and there's also some, a, a pretty funny story about my lack of athleticism from Midlands, my true freshman year. So we're going to throw it over to that interview now, and then we'll bring it back and wrap it up. Joining us on the program now, he's the head coach of the Princeton Tigers. He's a former Lehigh all American, as well as a guy that spent some time on the senior level circuit. The 2017 EIWA Co-Head Coach of the Year, Chris Ayers. Thanks for joining the program, Coach. That's great to be here. So, you know, you've been at Princeton the better almost a decade now, um, and you really have led the rebuilding, I mean, the building of the Princeton program. You know, when you got there, you know, I, I saw a statistic, 21 national qualifiers in your last seven seasons. And in the previous six years, there was only one national qualifier. So, you know, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think for some some people that haven't been familiar with college wrestling for, you know, maybe any longer than the last seven or eight years, people don't realize how far Princeton has come. What went into building Princeton into a top 20, 25 team, you know, from where you guys started to where you are now? Oh, that's a great question, and, and you know, it's there's a there's a lot of pieces to the answer. To be honest with you, um, you know, I think when people look at the, you know a program is turned around or someone makes this big jump, they say, "Oh, what was the thing that made that happen?" Well, it's it's a, it's a lot of different things. So the first thing was just support. Really, it was about the whole rebuilding uh, was about people. Uh, so it started with our recruiting. So we had to get the right kids. When I, my second year here, we had f- 15 guys on the roster, which was about half of everyone else. We were forfeiting on average three weights. Um, and, you know, there might not been, there wasn't one state champ in the room. Uh, so, so the first thing was we had to get recruiting. Um, and to effectively recruit, uh, you need other coaches. So I had to build the coaching staff from, from pretty much from scratch. Um, and then also to recruit, you need money. So we had to raise a lot of money. So it was, it was a slow build is what I'll say. And, um, there wasn't really one thing, but again, it goes to the people, uh, my administration, the alumni getting the right kids here and then slowly building that up back in the day when I first took over, I'd call, call state champ and, and they wouldn't be interested. And now every kid in our class is basically a state champ or nationally ranked. Uh, including this class that's going to be coming in next year. So it, <laughs> you just slowly keep at it brick by brick, uh, building the program. So it wasn't really one thing. It was just the, the, there was no foundation here. And so we really had to get the core things that make a program. We had to get those pieces in place. You touched on support, you know, and so much of that is the athletics administration. But another big part of that, obviously, is the community. You know, yeah. um, where you guys are at, New Jersey is a state, and you're not far from the Pennsylvania line. You're you, you you're in a great wrestling area. How did you get the surrounding area excited and interested in Princeton wrestling? Um, I think we do a lot of things. To be honest, I, the first few years it was really internal. I was just trying to fix all the things internally that needed to be fixed, raising money, like I said, getting the right kids here, getting the administration behind us right now we have a great foundation so now i'm extending out to the community a little bit and i do some pretty i think they're unique things um that are pretty unique to the princeton program for example uh we run the youth program so basically myself and joe dubuque and you know some parents in the community we we head up the little community wrestling program not like a 
club or anything, but the actual rec program. And so what I do is I go to the schools and I actually give presentations and I recruit kids to the youth program. So basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make wrestling really important in this area. And I know that if I build a pretty good youth contingent that kind of leads up to high school, it's going to get more fans to our matches. Um, and then, you know, even, even with financial support for our RTC. Uh, so, so it's just, it's just, that was one kind of grassroots thing. The other thing that I think we do well at Princeton, if you follow our social media stuff, mm-hmm. Twitter or Facebook, um, the coaching staff runs all that stuff. Everything you see is basically comes out of our office. We don't have some team of people who are marketing our program. We do that. And I think we were kind of on the front. We were one of the first to really start using uh, Facebook, Twitter, and all those type of things and use videos. And so I think that's helped create a lot of awareness around our program. Joe Dubuque is, uh, he's, he's our, basically our pro, pro um, like our, uh, you know, uh, promotions director. So he comes up with <laughs> schedule of the whole year and, and we, we really work hard at it. I mean, um, it's, it's important that we get our story out there. I think the more people that get cl- follow us and get close to our program, realize how cool it is. I mean, not many, there's not many programs in any sport who've, who've kind of, I mean, we were RPI my, my first year, we were the last place team, uh, of all the <laughs> teams in the country. So, like we've had a pretty good rise right now and it's, it's, and it's fun. It's fun to be on board right now as we're continuing to rise. So we're just trying to get people excited and we just want them to get on board and, and get on the train and kind of go on the ride with us. You know, the other thing that you really mentioned was recruiting and that originally when you called a kid that, you know, won a state title or those elite recruits, um, they weren't interested. So, you know, over time you, you have to take the, the guys that aren't necessarily blue chips and you, you build them up into successful college guys and you're able to get better and better recruits, right? As it's proven that, yeah. as it's Absolutely. proven that you guys can win, but there's normally, you know, in talking to different coaching staffs, you know, even understanding the process that Santoro went through at Maryland and Lehigh, there's normally that one big recruit, you know, the first blue chip guy that kind of cracks that nut. Yeah. Who who was that for you guys? Well, I think honestly he's he's a sophomore right now. I mean, Matthew Kolodzik was our first real blue. If you're going to talk blue chip, he was our first blue chip guy uh, in relation to like that that that. There's just another level of recruit that you you feel pretty confident that the kid is going to be an all American and and he's got a chance to win an NCAA title. And Matthew was an all American last year as a freshman, so he he was a big piece of us really attracting blue chip recruits. And we've got some coming in next year too. That kind of led to Pat Brucky, uh, who's crushing it right now. He's doing a really good job as a true freshman in our lineup. And then we have some kids coming in next year. I can't talk about it. It's public, but we're mm-hmm. not allowed to talk about it. But then you go back a little bit, maybe not blue chip guys, but just guys that we weren't used to getting. It's pretty funny. I go back to Matthew's brother, Daniel Kolodzik, who had, who had been an Ohio state champ and he was maybe ranked pretty high in his weight nationally. So he was kind of my first nationally ranked guy. Um, and then he, he, he had a pretty good career here, made it to around the 12. Didn't, we really needed an all American at the time. Didn't quite do it. Then we got Brett Harner, which is funny. Um, he was, he was also ranked pretty high nationally, but he had never won a state title. And then, you know, he, he developed well here and became an all American. So I kind of think of those guys as sort of the guys who really kind of made it okay to say, Hey, I'm going to go get the best education I can get. And Hey, these guys are winning. Um, and it's funny you say back to like how we developed guys who maybe weren't the best. I, I learned how to coach here. I mean, we had to figure out how to get guys who, were, who weren't, who weren't your typical D one wrestlers. We had to figure out how to get them up to speed really quickly. Um, so, that's been kind of a fun thing too. I think I I got a, I became a much better coach because, you know, you could, I couldn't just recruit the best guys. I had to, I had to actually make whatever we had at the very moment. I had to make it as good as possible. So, (laughs) so uh, there was, there was, I learned a lot in those, in those early years for sure. Oh man, I, I'm sure. Um, And then with, with Brett getting through two seasons ago, <clears throat> Excuse me, and Matt getting through last year as All Americans. 
Um, you know, like you said, it, Matt's older brother Dan was so close. But what was it like, and what did it do for your program getting Brett through that for your first one? Oh my God, it was you know, it was a long time. I had been when I left Lehigh uh, to take this job. I think two two seasons prior, we might have been third in the country. So it wasn't like we never. I never when I was at Lehigh, I never questioned like, are we going to have all American? It was like, how many are we going to have? And and like, you know, what uh who can win a national title right so that was the, so coming here it was like every year we didn't have one it was just a little odd and i knew like i couldn't i couldn't really grab these really high level blue chip guys unless we were producing an all american minimally um in my mind at least like i i'm a pretty good recruiter but if you don't have you know if you don't have results to put in front of guys it's pretty hard for them to make that leap so what did that do for my program Boy, it made my job a lot easier. <laughs> I could, uh, I, uh, we had, we had, we had a lot of good things to point to, uh, that we were doing with this building. And, and that's what we talk about. And we're still building by the way. Um, but boy, is it nice to go into a living room and say, you know, you know, Brett Harner became an all American. It was like the monkey was off the back, back a little bit. Now it's even better. Cause Matthew's a freshman, all American. Uh, that was the first ever here at Princeton. So just another thing to point to. So I just think they're tangible evidence that, Hey, you know what we're doing here? It's 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 right and it works. And if you come in, we take this kid who didn't even win states, and he became an all-American. I think makes it an easy conversation, especially on the recruiting side. For me professionally, I don't know if there's a video out there when Brett had won uh, his match to become an all-American, and I literally lost it. Like I'm pretty calm in the corner. Uh, he threw the guy to his back, and he's about to pin him. And I'm crawling on my hands and knees, slapping the bat like a maniac. And I and I looked back at the video, and it was just it was just pure emotion. Like I couldn't even control myself because I knew what was going to happen. And uh, and it was just yeah, it was amazing all around for our program. And 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 for me, it just felt like a lot of hard work had finally paid off in a moment, uh, which was pretty nice. Oh man. Um, so looking into this season, you guys have. I was looking through your schedule. You guys have a brutal schedule. You know, <laughs> you've got out of conference, and, and this is the kind of thing where you really see what level of program's trying to compete at, right? You get, you guys yeah. wrestle Virginia Tech, Ohio State, Purdue, Michigan. You go to Midlands. Um, and then in conference, you've got all the Ivy Leagues, you know, Penn and Cornell and, and everybody. And then uh, you guys already wrestled Lehigh. Um, you know, talk a little bit about what went into putting that schedule together you know what um what your thought process was and, and you know how that all kind of came together yeah so my thought process is pretty simple i i um yeah i want to win dual meets for sure like there's no there's no there's no doubt i'm not like a guy i'm not sitting here saying that dual meets don't count they all count i, I love winning dual meets i actually love dual meets uh but a couple of things on the schedule first I want to prepare prepare my guys for March. Um, you know, when you get to NCAAs and you put your foot on the line and there's a guy from Virginia Tech or a guy from Lehigh or a guy from Michigan, I want my guy to feel confident. He knows what that's going to look like. Um, and he's not going to have to bring some surreal effort that he can't produce to, like, overcome this guy. Uh, so the number one reason is it gets my guys ready for the end of the year. Um, Doing them early, we wrestled Lehigh, we wrestled Lehigh, Virginia Tech, and then Ohio State right in a row in December. I want to wrestle those teams. I want to see where we stand um, from a tactical standpoint, from a conditioning standpoint, from a technical standpoint. And this next period coming up after the Midlands is an amazing period for us to really work and eliminate weaknesses or or enhance our strength. So by seeing where we match up with these really good teams, we can make effective assessments moving forward. The final thing is like, look, I want to be a top 10 team. So in order to be a top 10 team, you got to be top 10 teams. And, and that's what, what I do. So we basically schedule to be 500 until we're a top 10 team, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So about half of our teams are in the, at least in the top 20 or in the big 10. Uh, I like to see a lot of Big Ten teams too, um, so we we know where we stand. And then, hey, well, once we're once we're better than 500, guess what? We're we're in the top 10. So that's kind of my thought process. Also, 
I wrestled this way too. I, I loved, I loved wrestling the best guys. Um, I might have had a little bit of a problem wrestling, like getting up for and getting excited for maybe you know like a middle level guy or a middle rank guy. Um, and and I think I kind of have that same philosophy now. I just want to see the best of the best. Um, and and two, like it's it's for me, it's like hey, you can get the best education you want with a Big Ten like schedule. So I'm trying to attract the people who are real serious about wrestling, the ones that really, really want to challenge themselves. Heck, I spend a lot of, I spend half my, half my time trying to scare kids away from our program to make sure we get the right one. So um, that's a little bit about our scheduling philosophy, um, but we just want to wrestle the best teams. So you kind of provided a, a pretty easy segue into what I want to talk about next. And you talked a little bit about your time as an athlete at Lehigh and, um, you know, for some people that may not realize this, I mean, you're, I think when you graduated, you were the all time wins leader at Lehigh, you know, and everybody yep. knows the tradition there. I think it, yep. it's just trends that's ahead of you now, right? Yeah, correct. Just trends. Yep. You know, so you're second on Lehigh's all time wins list. You were an all American there. You were fourth at the U.S. Open and the world team trials and you did all these different things. Um, you know, what did that time there? Obviously it does <laughs> so much for your de- you know, anybody's development as just a young adult. But when you look back on that time, you know, what did you take from the guys that you were surrounded by in a coaching capacity, both in your time there as an athlete and as a coach? Um, you know, what did so you I was in there. Yeah. I, I mean, I learned everything to be honest with you. And, I, and I'm still learning. I shouldn't say I learned everything. It was, it was a hugely impactful part of my life. As you know, it's uh, you're becoming a young adult and, and you're figuring yourself out and, and my story is unique in that I did, I wasn't good in high school. I didn't play some state. So I kind of did a lot of good things, you know, once I got into college, but I, I learned from, you know, Strobel was my coach. I learned so much from him and Pat was the assistant, uh, just in relation to the connection of everything you do in life in relation to how it might affect your performance. Um, and so it was sort of like, you got to be sort of like the Lehigh motto of be a champion on and off the mat. I really took that to heart. Um, and maybe I didn't quite have that coming into Lehigh. I sort of just loved wrestling. Um, and all the other stuff was sort of little nuisances (laughs) that I had to deal with like (laughs) school, school and whatnot. But then once I got there, I really, I really bought into the philosophy of like, Hey, if you're going to be good at one thing, you might as well be great at other things as well. So I really focused my energy on being, you know, great in school as well. Maybe not my first year. I had some bumpy, bumpy parts of that year, but after that, I really invested myself in school. And then just the other big thing, like along with like being that champion off the mat and living your life, right. The other thing that I never had, which was really odd for me, it actually kind of like shook me up a little bit because I thought wrestling was so much different was, was Strobel's have fun mentality, like wrestling's fun. Let's go have fun. Wrestling's fun. Cause I had been always taught you got to be tough and mean and you got to cut weight and all these crazy things. And he brought a really relaxed, a really relaxed atmosphere that I needed because I was so high strung. So I kind of like flourished in that environment. Cause he's like, no, you're supposed to have fun with this. It's supposed to be fun. You do all this hard work and you go compete and it's fun. So I really, I really adopted that mentality and, and, I, and I have it as a coach now. It's like, all these kids, all wrestlers put enough pressure on themselves, right? Like the most, most wrestlers are wound pretty tight. Um, so a lot of what he did was diffuse that pressure for me. And so I think about that here, especially in an environment like at Princeton where the academics are so hard and there's, there's like a lot of stress once they leave this room. So when they come down here, I want this to be fun. I want it to be a game to them. And, 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 and I view a lot of what I do is not like, getting them all psyched up and ramped up. It's more like, let's calm them down a little bit. Let's diffuse. So I think that's a big thing that I took from those two things really are the, are the big things I took from, from my experience at Lehigh. And then the other thing was I, you know, and I, and I'm sure you get this too. It's such a special moment where you get to, you get to travel across the country with some, some of your best friends. That'll be the best friends for your life. And then when you finish, you don't really even think about the matches and stuff. You think about all the other experiences you had with your, with your buddies. So I try to remember that as I'm coaching now, 
that this experience is just priceless for these kids. And we just want to make sure they have ever opportunity to want to achieve their goals. But heck, I want them to really have fun with this experience too. So I think, I think those are the things I really took from my Lehigh experience in wrestling. All right. I got to ask, what's the one memory of yours that stands out? Holy God. Um, (laughs) There's, there's, there's so many different segments, you know, like of, of, you know, the team and whatnot. For me personally, you know, I, I, I never achieved in wrestling. I never achieved what I wanted to achieve um, or, or even get close to what I thought I could achieve. But then when I, even winning Easterns and stuff, that was sort of okay. Um, I, did, I, I won Easterns my junior year. And that was a pretty big deal. But winning in the All-American round was a big deal um, for me. It was like, you know, finally, like that hard work paid off. I had a really odd situation to the kid I was wrestling for. He's this kid. He's like six foot three, right? You know, the guys I'm mm-hmm. talking about and legs and arms all over the place. And I was actually the fifth seed the season before at NCAAs. And I wrestled him first round the season before and I got upset. I got caught and I couldn't come back. Um, and, and I, and it really threw off my tournament cause I, I felt I'd beaten that guy who won it. And I felt like I was right on track to win it. So having that kid again in that moment was kind of an interesting thing for me, just because it's like, okay, so the pressure kind of got up a little bit because I'd lost to him last year. I didn't want, I didn't want this deja vu thing to happen. But I think once I placed, you know, it really, uh, I felt good about that. And I had, to, I had a lot of mental struggles in terms of like, I, I was very good in the room. And then, and then I I think so many kids are like this. I see this on my own team and I had so many little things that I had to figure out to get to that point and win. And it was some, some things were a little counterintuitive too, like what I had to tell myself. And, um, so it was interesting figuring those things out and and getting through that match. And I just think it was a good moment for me. Like a lot of hard work paid off because I did work extremely hard. What was it like? When you were there, you mentioned that team. It was third in the country last, you know, a couple of years no. before you finished up. What was, you know, I'm always, and obviously I'm a little bit biased. You know, that was a Lehigh team, right? But yeah, yeah. What was it like working with that group of guys? You know, I've heard stories, obviously, through my own coaches and everything. But you know, what was that group like? It was, it was, in, it was incredible. So I was coaching at that time. Um, and we were third, but we had the strength of this one recruiting class, which included uh, Corey Cooperman was a transfer, but then Derek Zink, All American, Troy Lowe, Travis Frick, All American, um, Stewart was the year before I think uh, All American. They, it was just a we had a ton of guys who could place right. So, uh, so what was interesting about that team is. I'll never forget this. And I was just talking earlier about like, you know, diffu- diffusing the pressure. This group of kids were funny, man. It, we were, and I knew they were different. I'll give you one quick story to kind of characterize this group. And, and boy, did we have a lot of fun. Um, so these kids are freshmen. We're in our four starting freshmen. We're at Carver Hawkeye. We have to wrestle Iowa. And, and me, I'm a coach, man. I, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm nervous, right? I mean, it's, we're in Carver Hawkeye. We just weighed in and I had, I, I had been late getting back to the locker room. So, and I think it's our first duel against like a really good team with these young guys in lineup. I go in the locker room and they're laughing and joking. And I, and I start li- and I'm like, what the hell's going on in here? Like, <laughs> usually it's like, you know, right before a duel, it's like a, the way I was, it was a little like a funeral, man. Like you, everyone's quiet, getting focused. You know what I mean? It's they're laughing. And then I, they're, the stuff they're saying, I start, I'm almost crying. Right. So this is going on and on. And like, and then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, okay. So uh, we got to wrestle in 20 minutes. We better get out there and warm up. So they go out there. We lose the duel, but we wrestle so good. Like we almost take out Iowa in Carver Hawkeye and then articles in the paper, the next team sick and all this other stuff. So, uh, so we put a real scare to them, but it was interesting. That was that team. They were, like where they were like uh, uh what it was it was like a little bit like the wild wild west they were like a little crazy but they had fun <laughs> with it all and and they you know the thing is they could all of them could score points you know so it was like a fun team that way too it was sort of like we were never ever 
We could get tens at multiple locations or big bonus points. So that team, that's one little story I would say about that team is, is it was, they, they just like to have a lot of fun. I think a little to the demise is as they got, as we got successful, we might've got a little more serious. Maybe, I don't know where we should have loose. You know, I think, uh, I don't know. Just thinking back, I was like, that was a pretty interesting crew. And, there, and there's sometimes chemistry between classes that are graduated and then some kids leave and it kind of shifts things. But, um, yeah, that group was, they were fun, man. It was, it was every time we went to a match, it was sort of like, Hey, we can win. <laughs> so <laughs> it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. Well, that's awesome, man. Um, yeah. y- y- you know, you got anything else for us? You know, I, I know I'm sure you could go on for, for days. Yeah. Any, anybody could about all that Princeton has to offer as a university and as a school, you know, what you guys have to offer as a staff. But I'll just kind of give you the floor. Anything else you want to get out there? No, I just think if you're a kid, if you're a recruit and you're interested in uh, challenging yourself in, in academics and you have a strong desire – to test yourself at one of the best institutions, well, it's ranked number one in U.S. News and World Reports. And you also want to have a Big Ten-like wrestling experience where you're wrestling the best teams in the country uh, week in and week out. We're, we're a pretty good option. Um, we're, we're not the option that's like, hey, you can come here and have a great education, and you also get to wrestle too. That's not our, that's not our, selling, uh, that's not our selling point. It's more like, tough on both sides and it's really it's really for a small slice of the wrestling community that really wants to test themselves in both wrestling and academics from a fan's perspective uh what i always talk about and what i'm trying to put on the mat is i want i want guys that are entertaining i want guys to go out and score points um and so we're trying to we're trying to draw a crowd we're trying to draw a following to our program and um if you're out there and you're curious about us i i highly suggest you follow us on facebook and twitter at the very least check out some of our videos because we work hard we think we have a good product i mean we're zero and three right now but i think we're probably one of the toughest zero and three teams in the country <laughs> <laughs> and i'm sure i'm certain we're gonna get some wins down the road here but uh that's because it's it's who we wrestle we only wrestle teams in the top 10 so far so that's what we're about. That's what I'm about. And, uh, and I, and I really appreciate you having us uh, on the show. I mean, we love Pennsylvania and you're, you're one of the legends of PA. So it's pretty cool to get on the phone and chat with you about our, about Lehigh. Cause we both went there and just wrestling in general. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Coach. Hey, you know me well yeah. enough, you know, I'll talk wrestling all day. <laughs> yeah, I know you'll talk for sure. <laughs> By the way, I love it. I have a funny story. I don't know if I've ever oh. brought this up to you. So Midlands, my true freshman year, when okay. it was my first time up at 133. And now to anybody that's listening to this that doesn't know, if you've ever seen me walk or especially run, <laughs> it's pretty it, It's pretty awkward, okay? It's not pretty. And you know where I'm going with this story, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Let's so it. it was my first time up at 33 because I was having trouble making 25. And you're standing there with Brad Dillon. And I go running by warming up, and you go, man, is Mason cutting that much weight? And Brad looks at you and goes, what are you talking about? He's up at 33, and you go, oh, so he just runs like that. <laughs> yeah, I, thought, I always said, man, it looks like you're struggling when you're running. It's like you're, you're fighting the wind or something. <laughs> That's awesome. But you can wrestle, so <laughs> you didn't need to run to be a good wrestler. <laughs> Thank goodness. And the funniest, yeah, part, yeah, the funniest part of it was I didn't know about that story. I never, I was never told that until about a year and a half later. And I was like, and I, you know, so I'm dying laughing. And I'm like, why did you guys not tell me this at the time? And Brad goes, you were not mentally or emotionally ready for, for that story at the time. <laughs> that's pretty, that's good coaching right there, actually. And the funniest part was somebody ever, when somebody tells you something, you kind of want to be upset about it. And you go, well, ah, no, okay, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> that's it that's that awesome it. that's awesome man uh, well awesome thanks for having me again that was great yeah thank you coach anytime you want to come on we're more than happy to have you cool man all right good, good luck the rest of the season yep see it bye all right as mace touched on earlier next episode we will definitely be previewing midlands maybe the sun scuffle as well and Mason, we will definitely be telling some good Midland stories, maybe even some some Southern, Southern Scuffle stories.
Yeah, I think uh, I've got some. I only went to Scuffle once. I went to Midlands four times. I've got some really funny stories from each one, though. The so Scuffle's not as much fun. That was the event that I came back from, and I couldn't lift my arm above my head. So, Yeah, it happens. But uh, definitely to all of our listeners, keep the uh, the listener questions coming. Those are good. And uh, we'll try to get those addressed next week. And with that being said, it's going to wrap it up for us at the VA Power College Podcast. Thanks for dialing in, as always. I'm Tristan Warner. Find me on Twitter at WarnTriz, and you can find Jason Beckman at Beck underscore Diddy. Visit PAPowerWrestling.com for all your wrestling needs, and be sure to follow us on Twitter at PAPowerWrestle and friend us on Facebook. Till next time, stay classy, fans.